So hi, everybody. I'm Kelly, and I am the head of adult services here at Cooper Siegel Community Library. And I am sitting next to Dr. Ned Katire, who is going to introduce himself and tell you a little bit more about him. But this is one of our, and my phone's ringing, <laughs> one of our climate conscious programs that um, we're doing around Earth Week this year. And it's a series of programs that's sponsored by the Fox Chapel Garden Club. So thank you to them. And um, we're gonna hear from Dr. Katire about um, fracking and environmental issues around fracking, which will be wonderful because I know so little about that. So I'm gonna hand it over to you, Dr. Katire, and um, change the view here so everyone can see you. Thank you, Kelly, I appreciate that. Let me um, share my screen. And can you see my screen? Yes. Very good. Okay, very good. Uh, and, um, you know, if, you know, people who are watching this should uh, just move your, uh, move the picture, the image of us uh, in the upper right corner on my screen, uh, you know, feel free to move that or just click out of it so that you can see the entire uh, screen. Uh, so Kelly, thank you uh, very much. Uh, my name is Dr. Ned Katire. Uh, I'm a pediatrician. I'm retired now from clinical practice. I still um, work for Allegheny Health Network Pediatrics, Pediatric Alliance. Um, I write a blog uh, every day called the Pedia Blog. I've been doing that for over eight years uh, and enjoying it immensely. I'm a member of the American Academy of Pediatrics Council on Environmental Health. Uh, I'm a consultant for Southwest Pennsylvania Environmental Health Project, which is a nonprofit organization helping people who are living near oil and gas operations uh, understand the risks that they face and um, uh, help them uh, mitigate those risks and protect themselves and their families. Uh, I am a board member and president elect of Physicians for Social Responsibility Pennsylvania. And I'm a climate reality project leader trained in uh, Pittsburgh in 2017. So uh, I'm gonna talk to you uh, all a little bit about um, uh, fracking uh, and how it threatens our health uh, at the wellhead, uh, but also beyond. Uh, and we'll start uh, with a little bit of historical context. Uh, and we'll start with uh, the Pennsylvania Constitution. Uh, Article 1, Section 27 uh, grants Pennsylvanians the right to clean air, pure water, and the preservation of the natural, scenic, historic, and aesthetic values of the environment. And that's not just for all of us, uh, but also our children, our grandchildren, and generations uh, yet to come. Uh, the Environmental Rights Amendment was ratified by Pennsylvania voters in 1971, uh, a year after the first Earth Day was uh, observed and for very good reason. Um, Western Pennsylvania has a long history of extracting and burning fossil fuels. Uh, the first commercial oil well, as many of you know, was drilled in Titusville in 1859. Uh, this photo shows oil and gas wells in Washington County, Pennsylvania, uh, which is where I'm from. Uh, and you can see uh, oil and gas wells as far as the eye can see. Uh, this was a common site in Southwest Pennsylvania. But a uh, hundred years before uh, uh, the first uh, oil well in Titusville, uh, coal was king. Uh, Pennsylvania's coal industry was established in the city of Pittsburgh up on Mount Washington, which was called Coal Hill in 1760, uh, 260 years ago. Uh, because of the close proximity to coal, and the city's three rivers, the iron and steel industry settled along the banks of the Monongahela, the Allegheny and the Ohio rivers. Powered by coal, uh, the industry created iron and steel to build our country's infrastructure. Uh, but it also uh, created uh, abundant pollution of the rivers and the air and caused a lot of disease and premature death. Uh, and the death and the sickness uh, were among the workers and to residents living nearby. Eventually, most of the steel industry went away, though, so, though some of it uh, still remains in the Mon Valley and the Ohio River Valley. Uh, but now we have a different fossil fuel that's being extracted in great quantities 
and at great risk to the air, the water, and our health. Uh, and that's unconventional shale gas development, which is based on horizontal drilling and hydraulic fracturing, uh, also known as fracking. Uh, there's a lot of drilling and fracking going on in the United States. Uh, the best known areas are the Marcellus Shale and the Utica Shale in Pennsylvania, West Virginia, and Ohio. Uh, but there's fracking also going on in Texas, New Mexico, and Oklahoma. There's fracking in Colorado, Utah, and Wyoming, and the Bakken Shale in North Dakota. Uh, and there's a, quite a bit of oil and gas development going on in California. Uh, as well. Um, and that's a state that is considering legislation uh, to ban fracking. Uh, this is what fracking looks like in Pennsylvania, the second largest natural gas producing state in the nation. Uh, we've got more than 12,700 active shale gas wells in the state, which you see is the purple dots on this updated frac tracker map. Uh, most of the activity is in the northeastern and southwestern parts of the state, and almost all of it has happened in the last 10 to 12 years. And notice uh, Pittsburgh on the left-hand side uh, is relatively free. It is free of fracking because there's a ban on fracking in the city of Pittsburgh. But Allegheny County does have significant amounts of fracking and that amount of fracking is increasing uh, as well as with all the other infrastructure going on in the county. Uh, the green dots that you see on this map uh, are all the compressor stations, hundreds of compressor stations that help move the gas along pipelines. Uh, and the yellow dots indicate where violations have occurred so far. Uh, in addition to all these fracked gas wells, Pennsylvania has hundreds of thousands of conventional oil and gas wells drilled over the last 150 years, 160 years. Uh, it's been estimated that at least uh, 300,000 of these unconventional wells uh, are abandoned and uncapped. Uh, and that's a problem. These wells leak volatile organic compounds and methane into the atmosphere, contributing to air pollution and climate change. Uh, the real prize though of the Marcellus Shale region, certainly this part of the Marcellus Shale, is ethane, uh, a liquid hydrocarbon released from the shale alongside methane and used to make plastic and other petrochemicals. Uh, all of these wells that you see uh, as orange dots on this frac tracker map in Southwest Pennsylvania and Ohio and West Virginia on both sides of the Ohio River produce ethane, uh, which is uh, meant to feed this massive ethane cracker plant being built by Royal Dutch Shell just 24 miles down the Ohio River and upwind from downtown Pittsburgh. Uh, this cracker plant uh, they don't make saltines, by the way. This is, uh, this is a plant that makes plastic. Uh, it's one of the largest ever built anywhere, and it will transform fracked ethane molecules into ethylene. Uh, once the plant is completed and operational in the next uh, couple of years, actually next year they say that they're going to uh, start operations, uh, it will produce millions of tons of these tiny plastic polyethylene pellets called nurdles which are put in boxes and sent to plastics factories uh, all around the country and around the world to create one thing that nature doesn't need any more of, more plastic. Uh, so let's uh, quickly talk um, about what fracking is. A lot of people don't really understand what fracking is. On the left of this graphic is old fashioned drilling, stick a pipe, uh, vertically into the ground into a shallow reservoir of oil and gas and up comes that black gold Beverly Hillbilly style. That's not fracking. Uh, fracking is the middle well in this image uh, which uh, the, where the drilling goes much deeper a mile or more uh, under our feet to reach an ancient shale rock formation. Uh, then the well is turned horizontally so the drilling can proceed laterally for a few miles more. Once the well is drilled and the pipes are cemented in place, millions of gallons of fresh water and chemicals and thousands of pounds of sand are forced into the well under extremely high pressure to fracture the shale and allow methane, ethane, and other hydrocarbons that were locked in the shale to be released and collected at the surface. But hydrocarbons aren't the only thing that come back up solid drill cuttings, rock and dirt, 
and salty corrosive brine return to the surface. Uh, the solid waste and liquid flowback are contaminated with fracking chemicals, heavy metals, and other earth elements found normally in these radioactive shell formations. Uh, Pennsylvania's Marcellus shell is highly radioactive with water-soluble radium-226 that has a half-life of uh, 1,600 years, and radium-228 with a half-life of just under six years. Uh, much of the waste is dumped in commercial and municipal landfills uh, where it sits percolating, and then it leaches into surrounding soil, surface water, and groundwater. Liquid flowback is then taken by trucks and injected deep underground a process shown to contaminate streams and cause earthquakes. Uh, in addition, some of this toxic brine is diabolically packaged and sold to consumers and uh, municipalities as de-icing agents and pool salts. Non-fuel gases, the, these are the fumes of fossil fuels, return to the surface and contaminate the air we breathe. Volatile organic compounds, you've probably heard of benzene, which can cause cancer in children and adults. Toluene is another volatile organic compound that can cause permanent neurologic problems. Polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons can act as endocrine disrupting chemicals, which interfere with hormone functions in the body, uh, especially related to growth and brain development in infants and children. Uh, radium um, uh, 226 decays into radon gas, which collects in basements and crawl spaces in homes near fracked gas wells. Radon, as you may know, is the second leading cause of lung cancer behind tobacco smoke. And finally, large amounts of methane leak inadvertently and are vented into the atmosphere and flared also into the atmosphere on purpose uh, in, uh, during fracking operations. Methane is an extremely potent greenhouse gas, and it leaks like crazy from fracked gas infrastructure. Any greenhouse gas savings you might get from burning natural gas instead of coal is instead squandered by allowing methane to carelessly escape from fracked gas infrastructure. And the wellhead isn't the only place where harmful pollution is generated. Uh, fracking is much more than what happens on a well pad and at a wellhead. Uh, um, diesel emissions uh, result from thousands of heavy trucks needed to service each well and from diesel engines on well pads that generates, generate enormous pressure necessary to fracture the shale. Pipelines scar the landscape. They occasionally leak and spill and they can corrode and explode. Uh, pigging stations maintain the patency of pipelines uh, by launching air toxics into the atmosphere. Compressor stations, again, they push gas through the pipelines. Uh, they um, emit copious volumes of air pollutants. Uh, pollution continues at gas processing facilities that separate and refine the hydro hydrocarbons that are fracked up. Uh, and then beyond at local uh, cracker plants, as we've seen, uh, and other petrochemical facilities. Finally, a large amount of fracked oil and gas is exported to other states and distant countries with an insatiable appetite for energy and for single-use plastic. And this fracking happens in neighborhoods where people live and children play. In Pennsylvania, the minimum setback distance from a fracked gas site to a home, a child care center, a school, or another building is 500 feet. Uh, well pads, pads and pipelines, compressor stations, and processing facilities are all operating where children go to school. Uh, this school campus in rural Washington County is surrounded by five well pads and other infrastructure. The closest well pad, as you see on the left, is 900 feet from this school's driveway, uh, the only entrance and exit into and out of this school's campus. Uh, the school is now surrounded by five well pads, uh, compressor stations, as I said, uh, pipelines, and an enormous processing facility just a few miles away. And fracking is happening around where our children play. I don't think there's any parent and certainly no pediatrician or nurse 
who would look at this photograph and find it acceptable in any way. But this is, this is our reality in Southwestern Pennsylvania. Uh, because they're growing and developing rapidly, children are more vulnerable to environmental toxic and pollution. Families are surrounded by uh, this dirty and dangerous industry. Around 18 million Americans live within one mile of an active oil and gas well. This is my friend uh, Lois and her four children standing outside their house in rural Washington County. Uh, Lois gives frackland tours to anyone who wants to see, hear, or smell for themselves what's going on in the Marcella Shale gas patch. I help Lois give those frackland tours. You can see Lois's house in the center of this image. Less than 1,000 feet away from Lois's house is a small compressor station indicated by a yellow thumbtack. Uh, you can also see three pink balloons indicating where gas wells are located and a couple of white balloons indicating where pipeline maintenance occurs with pig launchers. Uh, to some people, living in proximity to industrial sites like these might not seem so bad until we zoom out. Uh, and we can see the extent of fracking operations that surround Lois's house, which again is in the center of the uh, photograph here. Uh, and this is in Washington County, which is Pennsylvania's most heavily fracked county. Uh, there's a whole lot of it going on in this hilly, idyllic countryside. Uh, I didn't include uh, the thousands of conventional wells uh, that are uncapped and abandoned uh, in Washington County. I didn't include wells um, in most of the adjacent uh, counties. Uh, but understand that it's not just one gas well or compressor station that threatens the air Lois and her kids and her neighbors uh, breathe uh, and the water that they drink. It's the aggregate of all of these sources of pollution that threatens their safety and their health. People who live near frat gas operations report uh, many different adverse health symptoms. Uh, my colleagues at Environmental Health Project published a study in 2017 looking at health symptoms of adults residing within one kilometer of a, a fracked well pad in Pennsylvania. Sleep disruption is often the result of nonstop truck activity, noise, odors, and light while a well is being drilled and fracked. Headaches and throat irritation are also widely reported. Stress and anxiety are side effects of living near fracking sites. Now, some of these symptoms look like nuisance complaints, but when people are exposed to fracking activities uh, uh, day in and day out, from the pollution for months and even years at a time, these acute symptoms of exposure and stress often become chronic medical problems. Uh, in December, Concerned Health Professionals of New York and Physicians for Social Responsibility released the seventh edition of the Fracking Science Compendium, which is a fully referenced up to the minute compilation of the evidence outlining the risks and harms of fracking. Collected from more than 2000 peer reviewed medical and scientific papers, investigations by journalists and government reports. This essential report is a collection of the evidence-based science, which tells us that fracking has grave health, environmental justice and climate impacts. I helped review and edit the sixth and the seventh edition of the compendium. And like every edition before it, uh, the seventh edition contains no evidence that fracking can operate without threatening public health directly or without imperiling climate stability upon which public health depends. And I do wanna emphasize that there, is, there are no scientific studies, zero demonstrating that fracking is safe. There are numerous examples of drilling and fracking activities contaminating rivers, streams, and aquifers in Pennsylvania and other oil and gas patches. Uh, and, uh, and it makes the water unsafe to drink. Uh, in Pennsylvania, fracking companies have been uh, criminally charged and fined for illegally polluting surface and groundwater. Uh, more than 200 different air pollutants have been identified near drilling and fracking operations. 61 are classified as hazardous air pollutants and no, with known health risks, and 26 are classified as endocrine disruptors. Several others increase cancer risk. 
Common air toxics that produce serious health problems include fine and ultra fine particulate matter that can cause heart and respiratory problems, cancer, some chronic inflammatory diseases, uh, volatile organic compounds. Uh, I mentioned uh, uh, benzene, which can cause cancer in children and adults, uh, also cause uh, disease in other organs. Um, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, these are, are endocrine disrupting chemicals. Uh, they cause immune dysfunction and cancer. Uh, aerosolized fracking chemicals, the chemicals that they use for fracking uh, get aerosolized and we breathe them and they can cause disease. Uh, silica dust uh, can cause chronic lung disease and cancer from all the sand that's used to frack a well. Heavy metals like lead, arsenic, and mercury is very harmful to people's health, especially children. Radioactive particles and gases, uh, carbon monoxide, toxic to every human, ozone forming nitrogen oxides. You know, ozone uh, damages every person's lung function. Uh, and greenhouse gases like carbon dioxide and methane. Uh, with the exception of the silica dust, all of these air toxics are invisible. Uh, now, uh, we know that uh, air pollution is responsible for uh, many, many health problems throughout our lifespans. Uh, here's a list of cradle to grave health impacts from air pollution. Uh, doctors are very knowledgeable about this list. We know that pollution is bad. We know it, it harms people. Uh, but some doctors uh, may not be aware, and I know a lot of uh, people who are not doctors are not aware of the scope of the problem, namely that 9 million people die prematurely every year worldwide as a result of their exposure to air pollution, and that includes hundreds of thousands of Americans. Uh, multiple studies now show that living near fracking sites can complicate pregnancies and lead to poor birth outcomes like prematurity, low birth weight, small for gestational age newborns, and birth defects, uh, each one of these having lifelong consequences for children, uh, their parents, and their families. Uh, in addition to reproductive problems and poor birth outcomes, fracking is linked to other medical problems like childhood asthma and COPD in adults, heart disease, and increased cancer risk in people living close by. From 2008 to 2018, in four heavily fracked counties in southwestern Pennsylvania, two reporters at the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette uncovered 27 cases of Ewing sarcoma, uh, which you know is a very rare and frequently fatal bone cancer in childhood, and 40 cases of other rare cancers for a total of 67 rare cancers in children, teenagers, and young adults. Now, there are only about 200 cases of Ewing sarcoma diagnosed in the United States every year. Um, and it truly is a brutal, brutal cancer. Um, in Washington County, again, the most heavily fracked county in Pennsylvania, six cases of Ewing sarcoma and 30 other rare childhood cancers were counted in that 10 year period. These numbers are far more than would be expected to occur in a similarly populated, mostly rural area. Uh, over a 10 year period. And new cases keep popping up in the region. Parents and doctors are very concerned that pollution and radioactive toxic waste from fracking operations may be to blame for this outbreak of rare childhood cancers. Higher hospitalization rates from cancer, asthma, and heart problems have also been documented for people living near oil and gas development. It's also linked to other health symptoms like rashes, fatigue, nausea, sinus problems, and headaches. Uh, anxiety and depression are also common symptoms reported by residents living nearby. Uh, as I mentioned before, fracking brings foul odors, light pollution, and noise pollution, which can lead to loss of sleep, cognitive impairment, and stress. Uh, in fact, stress is a side effect of fracking and exacerbates mental health conditions in gas-packed communities. Crime, drug and alcohol abuse, sex trafficking, sexually transmitted infections and traffic fatalities all happen at higher rates wherever fracking occurs. Fracking jobs are some of the most dangerous jobs in America. Industry workers who are exposed to physical injury, air pollution, chemicals and radiation may not have the personal protective equipment and training necessary to protect themselves and their families from harm. 
Uh, finally, I, I want to end by talking about the impact uh, of fracking on climate change. Uh, the oil and gas industry likes to say that fracking helps solve climate change, uh, but that's a myth. A great deal of diesel fuel and natural gas is used in the process of extracting methane, which then leaks abundantly from frack gas infrastructure. Uh, the truth is frack gas is as harmful to the climate as coal. Fracking accelerates climate change and threatens the health of every child uh, and every uh, uh, child who hasn't been born yet, generations to come. Fracking is simply incompatible with solving the climate crisis. It accelerates climate change. It's not a bridge on the road to a cleaner future, as some would like us to think. Instead, fracked gas is a bridge on the highway to climate catastrophe. So I'm going to stop here um, and uh, just say that as a father and a pediatrician, I know that children live in a world shaped by our choices. Unfortunately, we're running out of time to make better choices. Uh, it's time for humanity to move beyond all fossil fuels, including fracked gas, and beyond plastic, and work together for a sustainable and healthier future for the sake of our children and generations to come. Uh, thanks, Kelly. That's, that's all I've got. So um, thank you, uh, Dr. Kataire. Um, I, let's see, let me change the view here. Okay, so that was sobering, um, really sobering. And I imagine anyone else watching this who maybe didn't know a lot about it like I didn't, um, feels very weighed down by that, um, those facts. Um, you know, my, my first question is always when I'm learning something new about I mean, any problem in the world is kind of what can I do? Or can I, how can I be part of the solution versus part of the problem? And um, yeah, so when people ask you that, when they feel, I feel helpless or powerless, what can I do? Why do you, how do you respond to that? Well, I understand um, why people might feel helpless, but really uh, you're not helpless. Um, there are things that all of us can do uh, uh, personally, we can uh, reduce our demand for plastic uh, and for energy. Uh, we can, as communities, find ways to reduce our demand uh, for energy, for plastic, and for other materials made from fossil fuels. Um, and, uh, and our governments, our local, our state, and our federal governments uh, can also do their part. Uh, a large part in uh, pushing this, the um, uh, the uh, solution to climate change uh, and also to uh, fossil fuels and pollution, which is a terrible public health crisis, um, not just in this country, but around the world, uh, our governments uh, can do something. That means we have to vote uh, and uh, we have to get our friends and our families to vote. Uh, and instead of, you know, hitting people over the head saying, you need to vote for this or vote for that. Really what we need to do is we need to start talking to each other again. Um, you know, the pandemic doesn't help. Uh, we're apart from our friends, our neighbors, our family members, um, but uh, we just need to talk to each other uh, because, you know, there are people uh, who uh, are benefiting from fracking. Uh, there are people that have wells on their uh, land uh, that are, you know, receiving uh, money for what they're doing. Uh, so they're benefiting and their families are benefiting. And, and there are some jobs, not as many as the industry says, but some jobs that are, are created as a result of all this uh, fracking activity in Southwestern Pennsylvania. And we need to, need to respect that, that people, they, they want to have jobs. I, I get that. Again, it's not as many jobs as they may say. But the problem, the um, uh, inconvenient truth is climate change. Uh, and we cannot afford to be fracking for, uh, for oil and gas. Uh, we can't afford to be burning fossil fuels, whether it's for uh, energy and electricity or transportation, uh, for industry, for agriculture, mm -hmm. for materials like plastic. Uh, we can't afford that anymore. The science is very clear. Um, and this isn't a political statement. This is, uh, this is a statement about physics. Mm -hmm. 
mm -hmm. uh, an atmospheric chemistry and, and we just can't afford to do it. That's the inconvenient truth. So we need to make other arrangements in how we live, uh, how we move ourselves from one place to another, uh, how we uh, grow our food and eat um, mm -hmm. and what we eat um, and uh, really how we care for this planet because it is our responsibility. It's all of our responsibility uh, to care for the planet, uh, not just for us, but again, for our children and generations to come. So I think your question kind of, you know, what can I as an individual do? Get informed, okay? Being informed is really important. You gotta poke around. Um, you know, you gotta, you gotta find information at credible sites, okay? Social media may not be the best place to be looking for information. Uh, Environmental Health Project, is an excellent, has an excellent uh, uh, web, website. It's an excellent resource. Uh, PSR, excellent research, resource. Our, our partner organizations uh, are, are just terrific. They have great uh, information that you can find. You can start at EHP's website and, and go on from there. Um, but uh, ta again, talking to your neighbors. Uh, and if you feel strongly, you know, write an email or make a phone call to your local or your state, or even your federal representative in, in Congress or in the state house or uh, in your county council and, and let them know how you feel. Um, uh, you know, you can be really cynical about politicians, but you know, most politicians go into it because they really, they do want to help. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of them don't really help very much, but um, that's, that's their problem really. Um, uh, the, but the fact is they want to make a difference. And they can make a difference by hearing your voice. Um, and then, you know, decrease um, uh, your use of single-use plastic. You know, don't don't buy plastic uh, bottles. Uh, use refillable cups uh, and and bottles. Um, don't use plastic utensils. Uh, be careful about where you get food. If you get takeout food from places that use a lot of plastic, maybe don't don't order from there next time. I know during the pandemic it. it you know, there's more emphasis on plastic, but uh, that that's just something that is, uh, you might want to do less. You know, your next car that you drive, you know, buy a more fuel efficient car, um, or even think about a hybrid or, or electric. Um, eat less meat. I'm not saying don't eat a hamburger, but you don't have to eat as much of it. You, you try to eat a little bit less. Your, your doctor and your cardiologist will thank you if you eat less uh, red meat. And the planet will thank you too, because it'll be less greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, and, and, you know, there are lots of things that we can all do a little bit of, if we can all do a little bit, it'll make a big difference. And, and we have to recognize also, as far as climate change, that uh, about 100 companies, multinational companies, uh, are actually responsible for more than 70% of greenhouse gas emissions. So they have a responsibility too, and we can push them by the choices that we make as consumers. Yeah. That's really, that's really helpful to think of ourselves as, as empowered to make small choices that affect everything. Um, yeah. Oh, I think you're frozen. But, um, well, yeah, are you there? Okay. Yes. See you now. Um, yeah. And as you were talking, I was thinking, I, I read recently that Ford, um, their goal is by 2030 to have um, all of their fleet um, I guess, either electric or hybrid. Um, so I feel like there's some encouraging movement, but um, you know, there's just big money um, in these businesses and it's pretty, it feels intimidating to think uh, that we could fight that. Um, yeah, but I think those small decisions. The, the thing is that there's a tendency for us as Americans to solve problems piecemeal. So, we just focus on electric cars. And electric cars are important, but that's only part of the solution. Or we all focus on agriculture and uh, regenerative agriculture and eating less uh, beef. And that's only part of it. Right. Um, and our plastics is a big part because the one thing I didn't talk about was uh, the danger to our ecosystems and our health from plastic as it breaks down in the environment. That's a, that's a huge problem. Yeah. Um, uh, but so th there are lots of ways that all need to happen simultaneously. What really what we need is a um, is a comprehensive, uh, coherent uh, policy 
that brings all of these solutions together so that we can all move together and, and all benefit, frankly, from making the transition right. away from fossil fuels and frack gas. Right. And it's really helpful. I mean, just to be informed, you know, knowledge is power and we love that as librarians. Um, and hopefully this program and presentation um, can help people become a, a lot more aware of what's happening. And, and as you said, it's really happening right in our backyard. Um, and so it feels particularly important for Allegheny County um, and the surrounding counties. Um, thank you so, so much for <laughs> delivering tough but important news uh, to us about this. And, um, you know, hopefully we can all start to make some of those small changes and really vote um, with these uh, issues in mind. So we so appreciate it, Dr. Katire. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly, for having me. I appreciate it. Thank you.